You are listening to Beaver Tales, Volume 1, The Secret Laboratory, by Studio Mike. Chapter 4, The Terrified Turtle We gather our thoughts and catch our breath down on the bank of the Big Muddy. Now what? I'm not going back in there. You're going to do what you should have done in the first place. Go to the village and get that stuff for Nana. I think she's right, I tell Freddy. Everyone is waiting on me. We'd better hurry up. Where are you going? Someone asks with a shaky voice. It's Terry, the terrified turtle. He's part of our crew, though we really only include him because we feel sorry for him. We call ourselves Pond Scum, though Penelope doesn't care for that name. The Pond Scum is Curly, Freddy, Penelope, Terry, and me. Terry is a soft-spoken, soft-shelled turtle, and his species are on the endangered list. Terry is the last of his kind, and having a soft shell is basically like not having a shell at all. It offers no protection, and he is scared of his own shadow. We are going into town, I tell him. Oh, I don't want to go in there. Too scary, he says, and slips back under the surface of the river and floats away. Mr. Brave, leave him alone. He's okay, I tell Freddy. He's a good guy, just nervous. I slide into the cold water and float along the surface. Freddy paddles next to me, and Penelope flies overhead. We swim with the current of the river and let it pull us downriver. We pass cedars and elm trees that wave in the wind as we slide on by. We glide past the big ancient weeping willow that sits next to the farm that rescues cattle. The tree hunches toward us, and I look up at it with curiosity. Soon, we make it to the edge of the waterfall that leads into Harper's Pond, which is where Pumpkin, my crush, lives in a den with her parents when they're not out getting into trouble. We get out of the water and trek down the wet stones. The falls are pretty steep and dangerous, and it's much safer to crawl down the stones that line the fall's edge. We make it down without incident and take a right into the dark woods headed towards Humble Village. I check my pocket, and I am relieved to find that Nana's list and coins are still safe and sound. Chapter 5. The Rescue We walk through a small wooded area. The air is chilly, and the water is turning to ice on my whiskers. I shake it off. Man, it's freezing. Thanks for the update. We walk past naked trees and through mud puddles with icy crusts. We take a left at a large oblong boulder and walk straight. Humble Village is hidden deep in the woods, lined by a thick brush. It's hard to find unless you know the way. We cut our way through the thick brush, heading north. I stop us. I hear voices, I say. I'll go check it out. She floats into the air with light flaps of her lovely orange wings. She floats out of the thick brush and hovers just outside of it. She quickly comes back to us. We need to go a different way. There are humans over there. Oh, great. Humans. What were the two-footers doing? They were picking on a snake. Picking on a snake, I say. Which snake? I didn't recognize them. They all looked the same to me. Let's go a different way. Wait, I say. We just can't let those humans hurt an animal. Yes, we can. We'll be doing the world a favor. I turn from the frog and walk toward the sound of the voices. Rain, come on, man. Let's just go another way. Just go ahead without me, I call back. I'll meet you there. Penelope floats down and sits on my head. I'm not sure you should be doing this. What are you going to do? I'll let you know, I tell her, because I haven't really thought it through. I push my way through thick branches. 
Ha ha, stupid snake, can't bite me now. I hear someone say, Stop. Penelope whispers in my ear, They're right there. I walk to the edge of the brush and look to my right. There is a short fat kid in blue jeans with shaggy brown hair, holding a stick that has a long brown rattlesnake trapped under it. The snake has curled his body around the stick and is fighting to wrestle it from the kid. You sound like a baby rattle, says a tall, skinny kid with buzz-cut strawberry blonde hair. Are you a baby, baby? The snake looks up from his struggle and sees me. The tall kid pulls a switchblade from the pocket of his red jogging pants. He presses the trigger and a long blade pops out with a snap. Ever wonder what the inside of a snake looks like? The boy bends down and grabs the snake in a spot where he knows he can't get bit, behind the head. He puts his knife to the belly of the snake and makes a small incision. A trickle of blood rises to the surface. The snake writhes and whirls. He lets out an angry hiss. Without thought, I charge from the brush and growl at the humans. The boys turn to look at me. Is that a beaver? I run toward the fat kid, grab his stick with my paws, and chomp down with all my might. The branch snaps, and the rattlesnake is freed. He starts to slither away into the brush, then comes back and snaps at the tall kid and bites him on the ankle. It bit me! I'm gonna die! You just gotta suck the venom out, instructs the fat kid. The redhead sits down in the dirt and pulls his ankle towards his mouth. I can't reach. You gotta suck it for me. I'm not going to do that. That's gross. You gotta do it or I'm gonna die. You're not going to die. Please, you gotta help me. The fat kid leans down and helps the redhead to his feet. We need to get you to the hospital. I'm not going to make it. Stop crying, says the fat kid as they turn to leave the woods. If you die, can I have your transformers? If I live, I'm going to give you a fist sandwich. That's what you're going to get. Big words for a dead kid. They stumble off into the woods and their conversation fades away. I look at the snake. He has a small cut on his belly, but otherwise looks fine. You saved me. I couldn't just stand there and do nothing, I tell him. Are you hurt? I think I'm okay. Thank you for saving me. It was the right thing to do. Not everyone would have done that, he says. And I think about Freddy hiding out in the brush. It was no problem. I'm just glad you're okay. I... Oh, you. That's not necessary. Yes, it is. And slithers off into the brush. Penelope floats down and lands on my head. Freddy comes out of hiding. I don't know why you did that. Because he's a good boy. We better get going. Nana is waiting, I say, and turn and head towards Humble Village. Freddy hops beside me. Chapter 6, Humble Village We enter Humble Village through a small alley surrounded by crackled stone. We exit the small alleyway and enter the hustle and bustle of the town. We're passed by a family of squirrels carrying satchels of lettuce and herbs. I see rabbits with bags of carrots and potato bugs eating potato chips. We walk past Humble Hardware and keep moving. We pass the pharmacy and the post office and keep going. I stop in front of Bumpkin's soda shop. I look through the front window and see Pumpkin. I wave to her. She waves back and has a big smile on her face. She gestures for me to come in. I look at the others. Let's get the stuff first. Then you can make kissy faces with your girl. She's not his girl. He wants her to be. Don't ask me why. Just look at those buck teeth. Quiet, I tell him, and don't talk about her that way. She's beautiful. Rain and pumpkin sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Stop teasing. You're just saying that because you want to K-I-S-S him too. Penelope blushes. 
I wave to Pumpkin, and we head off toward the grocery store. If it was a weekend, we'd be able to pick up stuff at the market, but we can't do that today. We enter under a sign that reads, Harper's Market. I'm greeted by Mr. Constantine. Hi, Rain. A small, bright-eyed chipmunk. His skinny little tail twitches behind his beige apron. Hi, Mr. C, I say. Nana needs a couple things for my sister's birthday. Can you help? Sure, hand me the list. I pull the list from my pocket and hand it over. He heads toward the fruits and vegetables. He grabs a small basket and fills it with a container of blueberries, a small bag of potatoes, carrots, and some strawberries. He brings the basket to the till and puts it down. Nana doesn't have strawberries on the list, I say, as I pull coins from my pocket. Not sure I have enough for them. You don't have to pay for those. It's a gift for your sisters. Can't have cake without strawberries. That's very nice. Thank you so much. They'll love that. He bags up the groceries and I hand him the coin. He hands back a small copper coin in return and I pocket it. I was hoping there would be more change, but it should be enough for a milkshake at Bumpkins. I take the brown paper bag and carry it with me out the door. Wish your sisters a happy birthday for me. Will do. We make our way back to Bumpkins. I'm about to head in through the front door when Penelope stops me. Don't go in. Something is going on in there. I stop and peer through the glass window. Pumpkin looks stressed. I'm going in, I say. Good luck to you. Freddy says and stands put. I open the door and a bell jingles above my head as Penelope and I enter the shop. Sitting on stools in front of the counter are three brown snakes. What's going on in here? I ask. Get out of here, kid, says one of the snakes. I can see all three have raised scars on their skin in the shape of an R. Rattlers. The rattlers are a gang of dangerous thugs that keep the village living in fear. Part of me wants to slowly make my way outside, but the brave part of me makes me stay. I walk toward the counter. You deaf kid? One of the snakes asks. Get out of here. Rain, please just go. I'm not going anywhere, I say and stay put. This isn't a good idea. You're going to get hurt. I don't care, I tell her. I'm not leaving. One of the snakes slides off his stool and comes toward me. He shakes his rattle in a threatening manner, and I gulp with fear. His mouth opens to reveal a pair of long, scary fangs. I start to sweat. Last chance, kid. He is so close, I can smell his putrid breath. The front door slams open, and the bell jingles loudly. What's going on here? A black mongoose wearing a small brown hat enters the establishment. His eyes glow with anger. I went for help. Freddy says from behind Sheriff Johnson. The snake in front of me stops moving. This is none of your concern, says one of the snakes who sits on a red stool at the counter. All the matters in this town are my concern, says the sheriff. You kids okay? We're fine. See, sheriff? They're fine. You can go now. No, you can go. Now. He bares his teeth and pushes his long, sharp claws out. The snakes look at each other's. Lucky for you, we were just leaving. Come on, boys. He says and glides past us and out the door. The two other snakes slide off their stools and glide on by. Give your parents a message for us. Tell them we'll be back soon. And next time, they'd better have our money back. Or what? Or else says the last snake before he slides out the front door and the bell jingles as the door shuts. What was that about? I ask Pumpkin. Thanks for coming, Sheriff. A complimentary milkshake for my hero? Sheriff Johnson thinks about saying no, but he can't resist. Do you have raspberry? You're in luck, Sheriff. Still a little bit left. To go? He nods. Pumpkin grabs a large white cup and moves to the milkshake machine. She inserts fresh raspberries into the machine and presses a red button. The machine begins to whir, and a light pink liquid slowly pours from the machine and into the cup. When the cup is full, she places a small plastic lid on the top and sticks a straw into it. She hands it over. 
The mongoose takes a sip, and a smile lights up his face. Amazing. So tasty. Thanks again, Sheriff, I say. No problem. That's my job. He takes another sip. You guys gonna be okay? We'll be fine. Thank you. He tips his hat and exits the shop. So yummy, he says as the door shuts behind him. Pumpkin comes out from behind the counter, and I hug her tight. What was that all about, I ask. She lets go of me and walks behind the counter. My parents lost a lot of money gambling, and now the Rattlers have come to collect. They owe money to the Rattlers? Oh man, that's got trouble written all over it. It'll be okay, I tell her. Will it? I heard the Rattlers dipped the last person who owed them money in batter, fried them up, and ate them alive. That's not helpful. Says you. Freddy replies and flicks her with his long, pink tongue. Ouch, don't do that. Freddy just smiles. What are you guys doing in town? Isn't today Hope and Meadow's birthday? We were just picking up some supplies for Nan, I reply. I show her what's in the bag. Ooh, those strawberries look tasty. I pull a couple out and hand them to her. She stuffs them in her mouth. Thank you. She says with her mouth full. We better get going. Nana is waiting on you. You coming to the party? I ask. Yes, Billy Bob and I will be coming later, once we close up the shop. Okay, good. We'll see you soon then. She blows me a kiss, and the three of us exit the shop and head back home. Chapter 7 The Riddle We make it back to Shimmery Pond without incident. Curly is there to greet me. Got anything good? I reach into the bag, grab a couple blueberries, and toss them to him. He opens his mouth and gulps them down. Yummy. Beneath the pond there is a rippling and my sister Hope crests the surface. She has bows in her hair and they are sopping wet. There you are. What took you so long? He took us to the farmer's house and almost got us eaten by Dreadnought. Then we ran into the Rattlers at Bumpkins. You went to the farmer's house? And he almost got us killed. Freddy! What? You did! I think it's time for you to go, Freddy. See you at the party? Of course! Nana hired me to do some magic. Can't wait. Oh, you love it. Freddy says with a smile. He dives into the pond and swims away. So annoying. I don't know what you see in him. He's a good guy. You just gotta give him a chance. Not likely. I stare at my sister. What are you doing out here? Shouldn't you be getting ready for the party? I wanted to talk to you. She replies and looks at Curly and Penelope. In private. Let's go. Where are we going? Come on. She says and floats away. Curly slips under the surface and swims behind her. See you at the party, I call to her. She waves. Hope climbs out of the water and onto the shore. I've been thinking about the riddle. The one I found in Seeger's Square. She pulls the scroll out of her pocket in her shorts. She unrolls it. Under the old crier where we used to count sheep and bask in the sunlight until we would sleep. With all that had been going on, I had totally forgotten about it. What do you think it means, I ask? I've been thinking about that. I think it's a message from Pa. I'm not sure how he could send you a message from the grave. That's not very nice. I'm sorry, but it's true. I recognize his handwriting. She says, holding the scroll up for me to see. It has to be from him. Who else would send me a Seeger square? Honestly, when I saw the square, I thought it had to be from him. So you believe me? I wouldn't say that. I don't know. It's strange. You think he might still be alive? I'm not sure. I don't know what to think. If I ever saw him again, I'd hug him and never let go. We sit down on the shore and ponder what life would be like if our parents were still alive. I look up at the trees and have a thought. What do you think the riddle meant when it said the old crier? I'm not sure. I was just thinking maybe it means weeping willow. Did you and Pa used to spend time hanging out under a willow? Hope's eyes widen, and she springs to her feet. She pulls me up and hugs me tight. You're right. That's it. What is? 
Pa and I used to sit under the old giant willow beside Happy Ranch. And he'd read me stories and we'd do puzzles together as we'd watch the sheep graze on grass. Where we used to count sheep, isn't that what the riddle says? She lifts the scroll and we read it again. I think you're right. So what should we do? Well, firstly, I don't think we should tell anyone else about this. Why not? You don't think we can trust our friends? It's not that. I'm just wondering why Pa would send it in a riddle if he wanted everyone to be able to find whatever it is we're looking for. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. But maybe you're right. We should probably keep us to ourselves. As we stand on the shore, there is splashing at the edge of the pond. Uncle Cody crawls out of the pond. Hey kids, what's going on out here? Hope discreetly slides the riddle back into her dress. Nothing, Uncle Cody. We're just talking about the party. Your nan sent me to come find you, Rain. You've been gone a long time. Sorry about that, Uncle Cody. I've got the groceries right here. Good. Let's get them inside so she can stop nagging me. She does love to nag, doesn't she? I walk toward the pond. I'm just going for a quick stroll to clear my mind. I'll be back soon, okay? Okay. But don't be gone long. I'll be quick. She wraps him in a hug. Thanks, Uncle Cody. As she leaves, Hope gives me a quick wink. She heads to the left and walks in the direction of Happy Ranch. Let's go, kid. He turns and dives into the pond. I hold the groceries tight and follow him into the water. Chapter 8. Getting Ready We enter the den, and Nana and Meadow are hard at work. There are balloons, streamers, and a pinata shaped like Farmer Anders. They've rearranged the room to accommodate our friends and family, with enough room in the center of the living room for a small dance floor. The dining table is covered in treats, cakes, and a bowl of deep-fried cedar chips. The coffee table is loaded with neatly wrapped packages with pictures of birthday candles and topped with ribbons. I go to my room and get ready for the party. I love birthdays because it's an excuse to eat tons of tasty food. I change from my favorite overalls and put on clean slacks and a crisp plaid shirt. I take a look in the mirror and am happy with how I look. I exit the room and catch something out of the corner of my eye. Is that you, Uncle Cody? What are you doing in here? Uncle Cody is sitting on the bunk bed. He has the Seeger Square in his paws. What the heck is this thing? I've never seen anything like it, I lie. Puzzles were hoping paws thing. He shakes the square, flips it over. Sounds like there's something in there. Uncle Cody, I have no idea. Should we really be in here? Where did this thing even come from? You have a lot of questions, and I have no answers for you. Let's get out of here before Nan busts us. You're right. We don't want that. He places the square back on the bed, and we leave the room, closing the door behind us. What were you doing in there? I just needed to borrow one of their brushes. And it took two of you to do that? Just let it go. I head to the table and grab a handful of crispy cedar chips. Uncle Cody joins me, and we see who can stick the most chips in our mouths. Those are for the guests. Nana takes the bowl away. We laugh so hard, chips fly out of our mouths and land on the floor. And clean that up. We do as we are told, giggling the whole time. Chapter 9. The Cipher It's getting close to party time, and a couple guests have already arrived, including Hope's friend Rosemary. She's a white rat with a pink ribbon on her head. Hi, Rain. Hello, Rosemary. You look nice. Have you seen Hope? That's a really cute shirt. Thanks, I say. I'm looking for Hope. I haven't seen her, sorry. I peek into her room, and Meadow is sitting on the bed, staring at the wall. That's something I find her doing a lot. Have you seen Hope? She shakes her head from side to side. No. She hasn't come back yet? No. Maybe I should go look for her. She shrugs her shoulders and goes back to staring at the wall. I decide to go look for Hope and sneak out of the den using the back door because it doesn't lead into water and I can keep my clothes dry. 
I walk up the shore. I head toward the weeping willow. Outside, the temperature is dropping. The sun is slowly setting, and when I stand in the sunshine, I feel warmth. As I get closer to the willow, I see hope. Why are you still here? I can't figure out what to do. She is sitting on a flat rock under the boughs of the giant willow, staring at the fields of Happy Ranch. Everyone is wondering where you are. She pulls the riddle out of her pocket. What was he trying to tell me? I read the riddle again, and I'm just as stumped as before. Do you really think that's a riddle from Pa? Yes, I do. And I think he wants me to find something. I sit on the rock and stare at the sheeps and cows in the field. A slow wind shakes the branches of the willow, and gray clouds begin to cover the sun. We need to go, I remind her. I'm not leaving until I figure this out. Everyone is waiting for you. We have to get going. Come on! This is where me and Pa used to sit and do crossword puzzles. Every weekend, he would stop whatever project he was working on, and we'd come out here and share snacks and work on puzzles together. I haven't been back here since he died. I miss him so much. I'd do anything to bring him back. Me too, I say. But please, Hope, we need to get going. What was he trying to tell me? She gets up from the boulder and it jiggles a bit. I think the boulder moved. I bend down and give it a shake. I think you're right. Help me move this thing. It's heavy. We bend down and stick our paws under the stone. Lift together, I say, and we flip it over. Under the rock, there is a small hole. Hope sticks her paw into the hole and pulls something out. It is a small glass cylinder. Inside it, there is another scroll. Holy smokes, we found it. She hugs me. What's in there? Looks like another riddle. She screws the top off and pulls the scroll out. She unrolls it. What does it say? It doesn't say anything. Look. She moves to the boulder and lays the paper down. I look at the paper and there aren't any words. There are pictures and numbers. What the heck is it? Hope stares at it. She's thinking. I don't know. I think it's a cipher. A cipher? Yes, of course. She says, mostly to herself. A cipher is a way to pass messages in secret, and unless you know the code, you won't understand it. I certainly don't understand it. I can tell you that much. But don't you see? This is proof. Proof that Pa wants me to find something. No one else would have sent me a cipher like this. I look down at the page. Why would he do that? I don't know. That's what I was trying to figure out. Well, you can do that back at the party, I tell her. It's time to go. Maybe the professor will know. Is he going to be at the party? What? No. But he's the smartest being we know. He was Pa's teacher and mentor. We can take it to him tomorrow, I suggest. We need to get back before the party starts. Or we're both going to be in trouble. Go ahead. Go without me. I'll be there soon. No, you won't. I know you. Once you start something, you have to finish it. I didn't start this. You know what I mean. I don't think you'll go to the party until you've solved that cipher. How can I? Pa wants me to find something and I intend to do exactly that. Okay. If we find Professor Kaufman, can we then get back to the party? If we solve the cipher. No. That's not the deal. We find him, we hand it to him, and let him solve it. Then we'll come back tomorrow and see if he's figured it out. I don't know. If Paul wanted the professor to have it, he would have sent it to him, not me. Come on, Hope. I'm so hungry. I can't think straight. We need to get back to the party so I can have some cake. Good try. She says and turns away from me. She walks off. You coming? Chapter 10, The Professor. We cross the big muddy using a fallen, rotten log. The sun is starting to set, and I'm getting worried about all the trouble we are going to get into for being late. We walk through a group of thick bushes and head across the Deadlands. The Deadlands are a large brown field where nothing grows. Even after the spring showers, when we flood the fields, nothing ever grows there. Nothing ever has. 
and we hurry across the deadlands because we are out in the open and it makes us vulnerable to predators. Hope and I make it across without incident and head toward the tree where the professor usually sits. It's a large oak tree where he can sit and watch all the happenings in the surrounding area. As I walk on, I start to feel an odd tingle and my hair stands on end. Stop, I say. I turn around and search the area. I think someone is watching us. The professor? No, not him, I say and keep looking. Feels more ominous. You're starting to scare me. I don't see anything. Better keep moving. We start walking again. We're getting closer to the big oak tree. Did you hear that? I stop and listen. I think I hear rustling behind a clump of twigs. Let's hide. We get down on all fours and slowly, quietly, crawl toward a big rock and hide behind it. And we wait. Through the dimming light, we see two brown snakes slither out from the brush. One of the snakes is long and lean. The other is a bit chunky. Get down. We hide behind the rock, trembling. Where did they go? The chubby one asks. I don't know. I think we lost them. Well then, we'd better find them. They stand tall and flick out their long tongues, pasting the air. I can smell them. Behind the rock, Hope and I shake nervously. We need to get out of here, I whisper to Hope. We're sitting ducks if we just stay here. Did you hear something? Hope puts her paw over my mouth. She zips her lip. We better find them. He's not going to be happy if they get away with that piece of paper. Hope looks at me. I can see fear in her eyes. She puts the cipher in the pocket of her dress. She points toward a fallen tree. I shake my head. What's so special about that piece of paper? I don't know. But the boss sent us here to get it, and that's what I plan on doing. If you can find them. You can't find them either. Whatever. I smell them. They're hiding behind this rock. They slither around the rock and hope to surprise us, but we are gone. We are inside the fallen tree, shaking. We need to get out of here. Hope nods. We crawl along the inside of the log toward a large hole that we climb out of. We move quick and head back to the big muddy. There they are. Hope goes right. I go left. Follow the girl. I run as fast as I can. Behind me, I hear the snake following. I don't know how fast snakes can move, but I hear him getting closer. Kid, just give me that piece of paper and I'll let you live. I take a left just as the snake lunges at me. He dies straight into the trunk of a tree. Ow! I don't stand around waiting for him to feel better. I head off. I run through thickets and rip my pants. I can hear the snake slithering behind me. He lunges and knocks me over. He wraps himself around me and raises his head. He opens his mouth and his huge fangs drip with saliva. Now, you're going to give me that piece of paper or I'm going to inject you with venom. And once it gets in your bloodstream, you'll have a couple of minutes before it starts to paralyze you. Then I'll eat you. But I'll eat you before it stops your heart. So you'll feel every painful bite. I shake and begin to cry. Get off him! I hear a voice coming from the trees. There is a loud flapping noise, and I see the professor dive off a branch and head toward us. Professor Kaufman is a wise white barn owl, and he soars through the air straight at us. The snake lunges as the professor flies past us. The owl circles around and comes back. He zooms by, and the snake goes for a bite. When he does, he loosens his grip on me, and I dash off. Move it, Rain! He's coming! I can hear the snake behind me, and he knocks me over. I tumble to the ground and hit my head on a stone. It stuns me. The snake begins to wrap himself around me. The professor has him in his talons and flies off. I breathe heavily. My heart feels like it's going to burst out of my skin. The professor flies off, and the snake is cursing him loudly as he tries to loosen the grip of the deadly talons. The snake lunges and wraps himself around the head of the professor. Stop! They begin to fall from the sky and splash loudly into the big muddy. Professor! I scream. I run from the brush and head toward the river. At the edge of the river, I can see churning and writhing under the surface of the water. Help me! The snake has his body wrapped around the owl and is trying to drown him. The owl gulps in deep breaths before he is dragged under again. I dive into the water and swim towards the fracas. 
In the dark water, it's hard to see who is friend and who is foe. I see the tail of the snake, and I grab it, and I bite down as hard as I can. The water begins to turn pink from his blood. I go for another bite, and he slips from my grip and swims off. Professor? I look around and can't see him. I dive under the surface of the water. It's hard to see where I'm swimming. I can feel rippling and follow the vibrations. I can barely see the owl. He appears to be stuck. I swim toward him, and his talon is caught under a rock. I place my paws under the log and lift. The professor swims away. I follow him to the surface of the river. You saved me! I grab him and drag him to shore. He lays down on the cold ground. That was close. You're telling me. I look around. The snake is long gone. Where is your sister? Oh no! I'm right here. Stop yelling. I'm so happy to see her. I grab her and pull her tight to me. The professor stands up and shakes water from his feathers. Where were you guys headed? We were looking for you. You were looking for me? Yes, we were hoping you could help us solve a mystery. Oh, I always love a good mystery. Let's get back to my place and you can tell me more about it. 